Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says, Former staff writes to Supreme Court judges alleges sexual harassment by CGI. There are other relevant articles as well. We have all clubbed them under one category. Let's look into the background first. A 35-year-old junior court assistant has a complaint detailing allegations of sexual harassment against Chief Justice of India, Ranjan Gogoi. She says the Chief Justice of India made sexual advances in his residence office and touched her inappropriately. After all these allegations and acquisitions surfaced on the online forums, Chief Justice of India Ranjan Gogoi presided over an urgent special hearing of the Supreme Court in a very short notice that happened yesterday. He rejected all these allegations of sexual harassment that were published against him by some of the online news portals. He also asserted that this is a ploy by certain outside forces. He says the judiciary cannot be made a scapegoat and said things have gone too far. Why? Because this was an attempt by the bigger forces to deactivate the office of Chief Justice of India because sensitive matters are to be heard in the court next week. That's the prime reason as to why Chief Justice of India comes up with these critical comments. But what we need to understand in this particular case is that this case that was heard yesterday violates certain principles of natural justice. So what are these principles of natural justice? There are two basic principles that have been recognized as fundamental in the doctrine of natural justice. The first one says Nemo Judex in Kosua that is no man shall be a judge in his own case. Why are we discussing this? This was a case against the Chief Justice of India. So ideally, he should not have heard his own case. But in this particular case, he heard that particular case which was surfaced against him in the online portals. So he has violated the first principle of natural justice, that which is no man shall be a judge in his own case. The next important principle of natural justice says, Audi altarum partem, that means hear the other side too. So what it means is we have currently looked into what the female has asked but there is also another side that which is with respect to the judge that is the Chief Justice of India. So this will also have to be heard. So on one side the judge should not have taken up this particular case. On the other side we also need to listen what Ranjan Gogoi is up to and what are his views about this particular case as this is just an allegation and an acquisition and still not proved in the court of law. Now, the questions before the Supreme Court are certain concerns that have been voiced in multiple articles is, how can the Chief Justice of India become a judge in his own case by being part of that particular bench which he constituted yesterday? After all these allegations are directly pertaining to the allegations with respect to the Chief Justice of India. Further, there is no formal procedure to deal with allegations of sexual harassment against the Chief Justice of India. And another concern is there is lack of mechanism in the higher judiciary to probe charges of sexual misconduct against serving judges. So these are the three concerns that have been voiced in all these articles that was posted. In order to overcome these issues, Earlier, the Supreme Court in itself had come up with certain regulations. So what are these regulations? It came up with gender sensitization and sexual harassment of women at the Supreme Court of India, prevention, prohibition and readdressal regulations of 2013, that which is in line with the Vishaka guidelines where the Supreme Court had to establish an internal complaints committee. So in line with these Vishaka guidelines, the Supreme Court has established Gender Sensitization and Internal Complaints Committee which is coming under this particular regulation of 2013. Now let's try and understand what is this Gender Sensitization and Internal Complaints Committee. This is constituted under this particular regulations of 2013. This will be headed by a sitting woman judge. So the idea behind this establishment is this particular internal committee will be able to take up 
all cases within the precincts of the Supreme Court, that is within the areas of the Supreme Court, which can involve people within the Supreme Court, the staff of the Supreme Court, the advocates who are working in the Supreme Court, and in case there is a victim who alleges sexual misconduct by the respondents, then such cases will be taken up by this internal complaints committee. So what is this internal complaints committee? This is empowered to deal with all types of sexual harassment on the Supreme Court's premises. Why was these regulations laid out? The prime reason is there were certain fundamental rights which have been violated with respect to the women. We have Article 14 of the fundamental rights which is violated. So there is right to equality which is violated for the women when there is sexual misconduct. Then there is discrimination which means there is violation of Article 15. Then there is also violation of article 21 where she is not able to live her life with dignity so in order to honor the women provide them and ensure all these fundamental rights of 14 15 and 21 are implemented these regulations were brought into picture by the supreme court so under these regulations any member so there will be a committee so any member of this gender sensitization and internal complaints committee may at any time request the chairperson the chairperson here is aided by the sitting women judge and they can call for an emergency meeting in case there is a sexual assault on a woman and in case this woman complains to this internal committee so when there is a complaint launch an emergency meeting will be immediately called within 48 hours now let's understand what is the procedure. So there is a victim. So this victim has gone through certain sexual violence or harassment. So this victim immediately is the complainant or she files a complaint within this internals committee. So this internals committee will further appoint an internal subcommittee to conduct a fact finding inquiry. So we have the major committee. So this major committee once again has the internal subcommittee. This will be immediately created and this committee will look into fact finding inquiry. So it will check whether this particular victim who has gone through this sexual harassment, is it a right one or is it just an allegation? In case it is true or it is false. So a basic inquiry would be conducted by this internal subcommittee and a report will have to be submitted to that major general sensitization and internals committee within 90 days from when this particular issue has been taken up. And in case this internal major committee feels that whatever report has been given by the internal subcommittee is right, it can immediately recommend the Chief Justice of India to pass an order against the respondent. Who is the respondent here? A complaint which has been filed against that person. So it can ask the Chief Justice of India to pass order against the respondent which also include barring that particular person from Supreme Court, making sure that he does not even enter for about one year and also recommending a criminal complaint for taking appropriate actions in the future. But now the question is this particular law says that gender sensitization and internal committee will have to put it across to the Chief Justice of India. So the problem is the regulations in this particular harassment committee is very clear. It can be carried out against any complainant with respect to the Supreme Court premises. But the problem is, this does not have an explicit mention with respect to the Chief Justice of India. And another major concern is, it does not also have mention about the sitting judges. So the major concern is the Chief Justice of India and the Supreme Court judges, are they coming up in this particular regulation? That is very ambiguous and that which is not explicitly mentioned could be a major concern under this particular regulation of 2013. What we have to understand here is, we will also have to step back and also see what are the steps that have been taken by the Supreme Court previously. Let's go back to the year 2014. There were two major advocates. One is Fali Nariman and the other is late P.P. Rao. 
these two advocates had also looked into this gender sensitization and sexual harassment of women at supreme court of india regulations when they looked into this particular regulation they also sensed that there is no provision that was mentioned with respect to the chief justice of india or the supreme court so they immediately said that there is no mechanism to provide readdressal when there is a victim voicing an opinion against chief justice of india as well as the supreme court judges so satya shivam who was the chief justice of india back then appoints a two member committee this committee was basically appointed to deal with those type of complaints in such a nature against the sitting as well as the retired judges this particular committee again found out that all these regulations in the 2013 did not extend or apply to the sitting or the retired judges however the major concern once again is that the supreme court after this particular report was submitted to the chief justice of india did not include any of the recommendations and and did not come up with any other steps that can be taken up in order to make sure the chief justice of india and other judges are also included under this particular procedure now that we have understood all these concerns what are the steps that can be initiated in the future there is no explicit mention of the chief justice of india or other judges so these regulations of 2013 will have to explicitly mention it that's the first key point the next point is in case it is a complaint against the judges or the chief justice of india then this particular panel should not include any of the judges of the supreme court so what we can do here is bring in the chief justice of multiple other high courts or judges of other high courts where a panel will be formed amongst themselves and it is this panel which will look into that particular complaint in fact as an alternative what can also be considered as senior members of the bar within the supreme court can also look into an inquiry in case of such a complaint so moving on let's look into the next article this article says boy hurt in celebratory firing so this article is about arms regulation we have had a detailed and an elaborate discussion of arms regulation on 24th of march 2019 so kindly look into it for the explanation so moving on let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about heritage bylaws that will be brought up in the future for the purana kila as well as kair ul manazil so even before we understand what this article is we will have to understand about the national monuments authority so the national monuments authority comes under the ministry of culture it has been set up as per the provisions of the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act of 2010 what we need to consider here is there has been a constant increase of the urbanization there has been concrete jungle that has been exploding in the urban arena there is development growth as well as increasing population pressure in the urban areas as a result of this increase in the population there is constant pressure on the land and because of the constant pressure on the land this is also felt on the land which is around the centrally important monument so what we need to consider here is that there is growing explosion of urbanization and population and as a result there is impact on the land and this land can also be in and around those monuments which are centrally categorized as important ones so now we sense that there has been massive explosion of urbanization so someone has to take care of it and one such authority is the national monuments authority so this has been assigned the task of protection and preservation of monuments and sites its responsibility is to consider grant of permissions to applicants for construction related activity in the prohibited and regulated area now let's understand what this prohibited and regulated area is let's say there is a monument and this particular monument from the outside boundary of this monument up till 100 meters in and around that particular region this is called as the prohibited area from the outside radius of this particular monument 100 meters from this is called as the prohibited area so in this prohibited area there can be no construction whatsoever but what we need to consider is there can be certain repairs 
so once in a while there can be degradation so when there is degradation or repair that is required the archaeological survey of india steps in and it can carry out repairs within this particular premises however there can be no construction whatsoever and what we also need to consider is there can also be no reconstruction as well only repairs can be done and renovation to the existing building can be done under this particular law next what we have is the regulated area so from the 100 meters to about 300 meters in and around that particular region is what is called as the regulated area so what is this article all about so this article says that the national monuments authority will be drafting a heritage bylaws for each monument or group of monuments that will also determine the nature of new construction activity within this regulated area so the proposed bylaws will lay down restrictions on the height of the new constructions among other features so bylaws would be aimed at at ensuring all those new construction are in harmony with the existing monuments so it lay all those precautionary measures and at the same time these new buildings in case are popping up in the regulated areas they'll have to follow a fixed standard that has been laid by the national monuments authority now let's look into one of the prelims practice questions in line with respect to the national monuments authority consider the following about nopes national monuments authority has developed this online web portal portal has used the technology and expertise of indian space research organization it is also used for large projects involving construction of building beyond 2000 square meter which of the following statements are incorrect kindly remember it is asking for incorrect so the answer for this is three only so let's look into the explanation so what does nope stand for it stands for no objection certificate online application and processing system this has been developed by the national monuments authority this has the technology and expertise of the indian space research organization however large projects involving construction of beyond 2000 square meter may have been kept outside the purview of single window clearance keeping in view their possible impact on the monument of the site so kindly go through this explanation this article here says iit delhi to introduce variety of new degree and short term courses what is the context the indian institute of technology delhi is set to introduce a variety of new degrees and short term certificate courses in the upcoming academic sessions one such program to enable working professionals who have had vast experience in the industrial circles have worked in areas of importance and application programming will be teaching at the institutes in iit delhi and that is what is called as the professors of practice so what is this professors of practice there are a large number of people who are working in the industrial circles these people have great knowledge due to the number of years that they have involved themselves in the implementation so these people's expertise can be utilized by the colleges so that these people can deliver lectures to the students so all those people who have implementational expertise and want to deliver lectures in colleges like the iit delhi are called as professors of practice because they have practiced it and now they'll be delivering lectures in the college but this will have certain steps that needs to be followed what are these steps first what we will have is the selection committee so the iit delhi will have one of the selection committees that will be coming up and it is this selection committee will lay out certain programs as well as rules so in case there are experts who will fit into all these criteria and will fall within the benchmark that has been laid by the selection committee so these people would be given an opportunity to teach at iit delhi so this program is basically done to encourage people working in the various industries to come and teach the students these courses that have been laid by iit delhi will also be given to the working professionals so what the iit delhi wants to do is it wants to broaden its base apart from the students it also wants to make sure there are working professionals who are given this particular provision of taking up this particular exam in case they are able to crack this exam they will also be provided the certification so what this will ultimately do is it will also enable the working professionals to get a degree from iit delhi 
another minor degree program will also be introduced for the students and that is in terms of the entrepreneurship so apart from the working professionals there will also be an other minor degree and this is for all the students who are interested in entrepreneurship so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article this article here is speaking about Hawa Mahal the Hawa Mahal is situated at Badi Chopad in the pink city of Jaipur it was built in 1799 by the king of Jaipur Maharaja Savai Pratap Singh who is the grandson of Maharaja Savai Jai Singh and was designed by the architect Lal Chan Usta as an extinction of the royal city palace why did this come up back then when you look at the 17th century there was prevalence of parda system in the society women had to cover their faces they cannot see strangers and they cannot step outside the palaces but these women wanted to see what is happening in their society as well so this hawa mahal allows the royal ladies to enjoy every day street scenes to the royal processions on the street without being seen by the outside strangers. So that is the architectural profess of this Hava Mahal. So this five-story palace was built in the form of Krishna's crown because Sarai Pratap Singh was devoted to Krishna, the Hindu god. Its unique five-story exterior is akin to the honeycomb of the beehive with 953 small windows called as Jarokas decorated with intricate latticework. This architectural feature also allowed cool air from the venturi effect to pass through thus making the whole area more pleasant during the high temperatures in the summer this article is speaking about Indian bullfrogs these Indian bullfrogs are prevalent in Indian mainland as well as in the Indian subcontinent they have no issues whatsoever and are living happily but there is a problem when this particular species of Indian bullfrog is introduced into the islands which are the islands that we are speaking about the Andaman and Nicobar islands when you look into the mainland there are enough resources there is Greenland there is enough resources for these frogs to feed on now when it comes to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands because there are scarce resources very less number of resources these are also eating up the resources of other species as well as animals so what is the present context these Indian bullfrogs which are introduced in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands have become invasive and are eating the native wildlife including fish and lizards there was a particular study that was conducted and this study has revealed that this invasive behavior starts at a very early age for these Indian bullfrogs so what is the context here the context is when this particular frog which is currently there in the mainland when introduced into Andaman and Nicobar Islands becomes invasive and start eating up all those resources which are meant for other set of species so another important key point that we have to realize is the IUCN status of this Indian bullfrogs is least concern this article here is speaking about a festival called as Gohain Uliyama Mela. This is a festival in Mayong village in Moryong district of Assam. The festival is organized with ancient traditional customs of Mayong village for its spiritual and mysterious powers. Mayong is considered as Indian capital of black magic and witchcraft. Kindly remember these facts. Then we also have to know about the Kirby tribe as well. The Kirbis are also called as Mikir in the constitution order of the government of India. They are one of the major ethnic tribes though not indigenous to northeast India and especially in the hill areas of Assam. The Kirbis are the tribal community in the Kirby Anglong district of Assam, a district that is administered as per the provisions of 6th schedule of constitution of India. What we also need to consider is now that we are discussing about the Kirby Anglong district of Assam, we also need to discuss the insurgency that is prevalent in this region. The Kirby Anglong is the largest district in Assam comprising various tribal and ethnic groups such as Kirbis, Bodos, Kukis, Dimas, Hamras, Goros, Rengma, Tivas as well as Man. The Kirbis within this particular region are at about 46.38% who form the majority of the population in the largest district of Assam. So where is Kirby in Assam? So this region in the map is the Kirby region. Now let's understand what are the various 
insurgency group that are prevalent in this region. There are number of people within this particular region who are asking for the statehood. They want an independent state away from Assam and they want to establish statehood. As a result, there have been number of people who are asking for a statehood which has been backed by armed militancy since 1990s. This militancy has been prevalent since 1990s. However, something major happened and this happened in the year 1996. Two groups that is Kirby National Volunteers as well as Kirby People's Force came into prominence. These two groups had a different agenda. They wanted to make sure that this Kirby Anglong district which is the largest district in Assam is taken out of Assam and wanted a complete statehood. However, they were not able to make sure that this idea came into prominence because they had different agendas together. In order to overcome this issue, they came up under a single platform. Their different agendas was disseminated and what they came up under the cloud of a single organization and that single organization was what is called as United People's Democratic Solidarity. So in the year 1999, both these organizations came up under one single banner which is named itself as UPDS. With time, what we realize is there were factions within this particular United People's Democratic Solidarity. These two groups, one involved following democratic movement, the other here included the militant group. All those people within this particular organization who wanted to follow democratic principles, wanted to have cordial relationship with the government, in short, that they enter into a ceasefire in the year 2002. So in the year 2002, all those people wanting democratic movement and affiliation with the government entered into a ceasefire with the Indian government. But there were also people who did not want to join this as well. In the year 2004, all these militant groups who were part of UPDS but did not ensure that there was ceasefire came up with a different group and that particular group is what is called as the Kirby Langri North Catcher Hills Liberation Front. So this KLNLF is a militant organization that was operating in the Kirby Anglong district as well as Dimau Hasop district. Kindly remember, this is a breakaway faction of the UPDS that was formed in the year 2004. This KLNLF also had close coordination with other organizations as well as groups. Which are these? One, it is Ulfa in Assam as well as it also has reported links with the Nagaland based National Socialist Council of Nagaland, Isak Muwa, which is based in Nagaland. This KLNLF along with its linkage groups are exposing a particular objective. So what is this particular objective? It is called as Hemprek Kantim, which means self-rule, self-determination or an independent state away from Assam. So the basic objective of KLNLF is we want an independent state where we would be taking control of whatever operations are happening within this region of Kirby Angla. With time, this particular group also came into a democratic fold. They also came into a democratic fold and enter into a ceasefire with the government. Again, within this particular group, there were anti-talk factions. Those people who did not want peace with the government. So these people who did not want peace with the government did not want the ceasefire. Such people came to be known as Karbi People's Liberation Tiger. This is an anti-talk faction of the KLNLF and this particular group further initiated the armed militancy against the civilian democracy. This particular group that is Kirby People's Liberation Tiger openly challenged the civil administration and political leaders by frequently calling for the bunch. So these people who are the break away from the KLNLF did not pay heed to the civilian administration, political parties and repeatedly called for Bandh. Being the only armed fighting force for the Kirby statehood, it also enjoys illicit support from other political groups who are fighting for this particular cause. So what is the objective of this? The objective of this organization is to make sure that there is an autonomous Kirby state out of Assam. This organization also has linkages with the NDFB that is the National Democratic Front and it also has close affiliations with the NSCN 
Keplong faction. Consider the following about Olive Ridley. Its IUCN status is endangered. They are best known for the unique mass nesting called as Aribada. The answer for this is two only. Why? Because the IUCN status is not endangered. It is vulnerable. Why have we picked this article? That is because it says over 1 lakh olive ridley turtles enter sea in Odisha. Let's look into the next practice question. Peiku or Beitu mountain is in which country? This is in North Korea. What is the context? South Korea's moon visits sacred North Korean mountain with Kim. And where is it? It is present at the borders of China and North Korea and it is present here. Moving on, let's look into the previous year question. The terms event horizon, singularity, string theory and standard model are sometimes seen in news is in the context of observation and understanding of universe. In case you have liked our initiative, want to encourage us more, please do like our videos, comment on our comment section and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.